edition of the On the Mic podcast, and uh, we stepped outside of the cage. We're going to remain out of the cage with someone who spent so much of his life inside the cage. I, I want to introduce him as UFC legend, former champion, amazing fighter, Frankie Edgar, but I, I think I got a Donnie Mac. I feel like <laughs> I, I don't know how there to you introduce you. Oh, that's awesome. Hell yeah. Hey, thanks for having me on, man, man. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, obviously, getting the opportunity to talk to you because of this new movie. <laughs> Uh, that you're featured in, The Bastard Sons. Uh, the episode before this just talked to the main man, Kevin Internato himself. But, you know, I I'll ask you the MMA questions later. I want to get into, first and foremost, he kind of broke it down to me about how the he came to you with this. But when it was presented to you, was like being in a movie or TV, is something that, is it something you've always wanted to do? I mean, I don't know if it's something I aspire to do. You know, I obviously have respect. You know, I'm, I'm, I love movies and TV shows and all that stuff. I I'm definitely a fan of that. In that aspect, uh, um, I mean, Rocky is probably one of the reasons why I fight, like watching movies like that, um, you know, blood sport, kickboxing, all that type of stuff. So, uh, to I never thought I would do it, but I, you know, I'm I'm always game to to test test myself in different areas. So, when he presented this to me, um, yeah, I jumped at it. I thought it was uh, it was it was a unique experience. Uh, and Kevin's a super cool dude, super good guy. The whole crew and cast were uh, welcoming and helpful and. Uh, it was just all around great experience. I told him one thing I really complimented him on was, and I don't have to tell you, you know how many of your colleagues in the sport get casted in a TV show or in a movie, and their scenes are just being the the fighter, right? They're just throwing head kicks and doing jujitsu. You're shooting guns, Frankie. Like you're yeah. shooting guns. Like it was so unique to have a guy who is so recognizable worldwide but he's not putting someone in a rear naked choke. He's shooting at him and he's taking a bullet, you know, without giving the, uh, the movie away. W was it having kind of like that freedom? Cause like I said, Kevin just talked to me. So a lot of these questions are going to be based off of that too, but was having that freedom a little more like relaxing where you're like, oh, I'm not expected to come in and be this guy. I just got to be myself. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was what the good thing about the movie when Kevin presented to, to my, my, me, you know, myself, Roger, my podcast partner was also in it, or co-host. And, uh, um, when, when he presented to us, he's like, you know, I don't want you to act. I just want you to remember, memorize your lines and be yourself. I'm like, all right. So as I'm reading the script, I'm like, like you mentioned before, I'm getting shot. I'm like, bro, I got, I got to act a little bit. There's a little acting going on, you know, but, uh, but nothing over the top. I didn't have to, you know, do no fight scenes or anything like that. Crazy. Um, yeah, but the, you know the gunfight scene was, was was super fun. I mean, playing cops to robbers, dude. It's like you know, it's like I'm five years old again. So it was a lot of fun. And now I did tell him, while it was nice to see you cast in a different role, you mentioned your your podcast partner Roger Matthews, the champ, the champ in the tramp podcast, which I listen to religiously. Um, I don't know if Kevin could have casted a perfect more a more perfect person than Roger in the role that Roger played. Yeah, dude. He, I mean, he, you know, he had a, he had a, a, a kind of a small role, but a definitely a mem memorable part, you know. And um, uh, you know, he's a he's a monster of a dude, six four, two hundred sixty pounds. That guy. So yeah, it it was fitting for him, perfect. And uh, you know, if this movie does well, I hear there could be a sequel, and uh, hope to see more of Roger in that one. I uh, I pushed for it already because I've already since since the interview, both of your interviews have been booked. Uh, I watched it like two times already. We talked about the plot twist and all of that. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know, when, when it comes to Roger, I was like, Ke Kevin, was it just, hey, Roger, I'm going to find the smallest dress shirt I can that fits you. And then <laughs> I'm going to go beat people up. And he's like, that, no, I mean, don't worry. Hey, Rod Roger owns that shirt. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> <laughs> he brought it with him on set. But, uh, you know, one thing when you mentioned, you know, just kind of how it was brought to you, I did ask Kevin, and I'm not brownism, but I, I did ask Kevin. I asked if you had a future in film and TV and he emphatically said, yes. So what, if it were presented to you, is it more along the lines of something and what you were just in like the bastard sons where I'm not saying everything's got to be Jersey related, but where it's relaxing, you're not kind of put into a mold where you can just go in and do your own thing. Is that something you'd want to continue to be open to? I think that would be more realistic, you know, um, I'm not, you know, my, my kids are in, in like the, the high school, middle school, elementary school phase of, of life. And I don't want to be gone for too long, any of that stuff. So it, it's got to all make sense. And, 
I'm not really seeking out anything, but if something gets presented to me and, and, and I like it, I make sense kind of like this, this last situation, I probably would jump all over it. I, like I said, I, I did really enjoy the process. Um, yeah. So you never know. I, I, I'm, I'm, like I said before, I'm always willing to take, take some chances, try some things I have never tried before. So if something comes across my desk that, that I can't say no to, I could definitely see myself doing it again. How much of it being in your backyard of New Jersey and kind of, you know, I think the perfect movie review I saw on this on the Bastard Sons was it's four brothers meets the Sopranos. And I and I love that. I, I felt that five minutes into the movie. But how much of it being in Jersey made you like really get up and be like, yeah, obviously I'm in. Yeah, no, I mean, that was that was the, the, the one part with uh with. um I don't know if I lost you there a second. No, yeah. No, no. The, the the one part with uh where where Roger had his scene that was filmed right in my town so um yeah it it was cool it was, uh in other stuff was like North Jersey and then we went to the Poconos or something so all local stuff all stuff I'm I'm at all the time it felt very uh felt felt like home <laughs> you know and, and it was a and it was a job well done and I and I think you did a great job obviously love the ending scene I was like you yeah, you know yeah. you got you got so many great moments. And then just to have you captured at the end in that moment where you kind of just take over. I mean, I, with everything that had happened to your character in the movie, I think it was perfect. Um, have have uh, you heard from everyone around you, family, friends? Have they gotten all to see it yet? Yeah, yeah. All my people, are, you know, they're into it. They, they, you know, I got good friends, man. They, they, uh, they wouldn't tell me to, you know, they wouldn't hurt my feelings. But uh, <laughs> for, for the most part, for the most part, it's, it's been all positive and, um, yeah, it, it's just a cool experience, you know, get to talk about the movie, you know, talk to MMA guys like yourself and, you know, talk talk other stuff besides fighting. So it, it, it's it's cool. Yeah, and I'm, I'm holding off the MMA questions just because obviously, you know, there's plenty to ask you. And, you know, when I first got into the sport, Mark Henry was a guy who really looked out for me. So I've always been Team Jersey, obviously, yeah. with all you guys. And it just – it's something where it, – it, let's go back to the movie – you know, you don't see a lot of these movies anymore, whether it's because people are scared to go to that line or they just don't understand the culture anymore because everything changes. How authentic, when you go back and watch it, did it feel to you compared to, and I know this is an easy comparison, but compared to a Sopranos where, hey, we've got crime bosses and we've got mob, no, not mafia or mob because, you know, Kevin made a point to not bring those words into the movie, but a bunch of people who commit crimes or live a, yeah. a crime ridden I mean, life. Gangsters. I mean, yeah, gangsters. Yeah. gangsters. Yeah. You know, they're gangsters yeah. and uh, yeah. in, in, in different walks of life. Um, there's gangsters in, in every walk of life, really. That, that you know, if you think about it. So that's just the, the gangsters of the, of the underworld of, of the criminal criminal uh, essence. And uh, yeah, I mean, listen, Jersey. We all know somebody that knows somebody. You know, and. Uh, that's why it really resonates with, with, you know, if you grew up where I am and, you know, if, if you're not Italian, you, you're half Italian, you know what I mean? So it kind of makes sense for, 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 uh, for the plot to be, you know, Jersey based. Yeah. That's actually, I think that's why I love it so much. Cause I am half Italian. I didn't grow up in Jersey, but I've lived there multiple times throughout my life. I'm originally, I'm still right now in Chicago. So when you spend some time kind of like where some of the filming took place, you're like, oh, I know where that's at. And then you're like, I understand why this is happening. So uh, I don't know, man, if if we get a sequel, are you taking over? Are you taking over? Are you taking uh, no, I don't know, but I don't know. I think, I think Donnie, Donnie seems like a loyal cat. So uh, we'll, we'll see how, how, uh, how Kevin decides to play it all out. But uh, I, I would be super pumped to do a, a sequel. And, uh, and Kevin kind of, kind of gave me some uh some ideas of what direction he wants to go and it's uh it's definitely mind blowing too. Yeah, that's I, I you know, I, I heard I heard a few things and uh nothing about it, but your reaction is what I was told. And uh just hearing your reaction as someone who was there and doing it, uh it, it gets me even more excited because the first thing I said was, all right, what's next? Like what happens yeah. now? You yeah. know? Um so uh definitely interested in that. But man, Frankie, you had such a legendary career before I ask you about that. As a podcast guy myself, you know, you got the champ in the tramp podcast. Uh, everyone can subscribe on YouTube to your channel. And I highly encourage that they do. What brought that out of you? And also what led you to be like, all right, I, I will acknowledge and talk about fighting, but that's not everything we're going to do here. 
Yeah, uh, you know, I, I just started becoming a fan of podcasting, you know, listening to, to Rogan mostly for the most part, you know, and, and others. Um, and I just said, hey, why not? I, I, I had this room in my house. Uh, he, I was friends with Roger. He kind of has a totally different fan base than I do. I figured, you know, we can go in here. It's in, We do it once a week. It's in my basement. Chop it up with a buddy of mine. And like you said, we don't talk about fighting. We definitely cover fighting. Uh, but we pretty much talk about everything. Everything that, uh, you know, a, a truck driver and, ex a, and a fighter would talk about, I guess. So pretty much typical shit like people like me and you would, 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 talk, would talk about. And, you know, we're no experts. We definitely get some heat from, from people for talking about – we talk about current events, you know. And uh, I'm just keeping it real on what I think or not even what I think. Just because I don't know what I think in this world nowadays, today, day, day, day and age. I'm uh, just taking in for the, we relay information and we, you know, we kind of do it crudely. So I could get see why people may take us a certain way, but uh, we have fun with it. And um, yeah, we'll keep doing it until, you know, the FCC comes and closes down. <laughs> well, I don't think that's going to be anytime soon. You mentioned Rogan, you know, that's a guy who got me into the business of not only MMA, but podcasting. And, you know, how, as, as a guy who has such a loyal fan base, like yourself, how important is it for you to be like, I'm not going to just change who I am. I'm going to, be crude. I'm going to say it straight up and I'm going to talk on how I feel. I'm not going to stick to a certain script just for a sponsor's sake or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm not one on social media to weigh in on stuff. That's just not my thing. I'm not that guy. I kind of, you know, I post my, my fight stuff, my promotional stuff, my family stuff, you know, keep people up to date. But uh, for the most part, I'm not weighing in on, on hot topic issues. But on my podcast, I kind of do, you know, but I, I'm not putting it out there for the, like, I feel like in social media on, on like, you know, Twitter, and Instagram, whatever, you're kind of pushing it out. I'm not like, they got to come and see me. So if you come and look for it, I'll tell you how I feel. And you may not like it, but the good thing is you could, you know, tune out. That's, that's the good thing. As someone who admittedly started covering the MMA game late, uh, now it's been quite a few years now. Um, but I unfortunately, or fortunately, got introduced to Roger Matthews before Frankie Egger. So now, full circle, fly on the wall. What is that friendship like? Because I saw Roger as America did in one way. You've gotten to know him in a totally different way. What is that friendship like? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're good, but I've known Roger since 2007 since before he met Jay wow and you know was a, a jersey shore guy and this and that so uh yeah we, i've known him he actually i used to teach a, 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 a like a informal i guess mma jiu-jitsu class and uh he used to come to that and stuff and that's kind of how we first uh, first became buddies but uh yeah he, he's a good dude man he's uh he's a good father uh he's a good podcast partner and uh you know we're consistent man we don't miss a tuesday so we're always here that, that's the, the best thing yeah, and I was always, for the record, I was always Team Roger because I was like, dude, get <laughs> out of there, dude. Get yeah. him out of there. Like, I, I, I won Roger in a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, listen, then we all won, right? Because now we got the podcast, we got the stories, we all won. And I think we all won watching your career. And if I just ask you one simple thing uh, to start my a couple of MMA questions I have for you, when you look back at it all, if you could summarize it all up, and I know you've been through so much, uh, ups, downs, championships, all that, legendary fights. If you could sum up your fighting career, how would you do it? Mm. <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I would say someone that, that always tried fighting the best guy, never said no to a, a matchup, always left it all in there. Um, I never walked into a fight thinking I was going to lose. None of never. Not, I know I didn't win them all, but I prepared like I was going to win them all. And that's why I could walk away you know, with well, my, my head, my head held high, you know, and uh, I'm uh, grateful for all the people I've met in this sport and, and, you know, the friendships I've made. It's, uh, this is, you know, part, it's part of who I am, part of my legacy in this life. And uh, I, I, I'm, just, I'm happy, had a, a happy career, amazing career. Yeah. And uh, hope maybe we're looking at the uh, second chapter uh, of a new career for you. Um, You know, it, I mean, you're not that far removed from active competition, but we have seen over the past, I would say, especially in 2023, we've seen so much ugly um, in, in the sport. And, you know, you're a guy that obviously was intertwined with Conor McGregor. And ever since then, it's been everyone trying to follow mm -hmm. that mold. And it's gotten a little ugly. Has the sport changed so much or, or that much since when you first got into it? 
Oh, so I first got into it, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's night and day, but um, the fights are still real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the good thing. Um, it just has this little promo, WWE type promo effect now. The McGregor effect, you know, he came in, he uh, kind of turned his game on his head, and um, now everybody thinks they got to go about it that way. And unfortunately, no one, no one's as good as him at it. You know, um, there's a few guys that are that are authentic and you know make their own way, but everyone else is trying the uh, maybe not the 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 most classy way and kind of people stepping over lines and whatnot. But all in all, I mean, it does sometimes lead to the good fights, and and luckily the fights are still going to be real. Until we get to that br- bridge, I guess we're, we'll be all right. Yeah, right. Uh, well, that's what the, my next question was going to be: was how is an Italian from Jersey, like, and, and a fighter through and through, like, how do you feel about like when these guys are taking it to that line or crossing that line? Um, because you know, at the end of the day, like Dana White says, listen, this is a fight business, and they just it's going to make for a better fight, like you said. But I would imagine, as a man, as a father. Like certain things you want to get, like, let's keep that out. Yeah, I mean, that's how I am, you know. Uh, but like, you know, Dan, it's, it's just, there's millions of different people in this world, millions of different types of fans too. Like some people are into that stuff, you know. So there's, there's going to be a market for everything, for every type of personality, every type of spot style. There's going to be a market for it. So, you know, you, 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 this is what it is. And uh, I, I guess that I, I, that's how I played it. You know, my old man used to say, you got, no, it's not the loud guy I got to worry about. It's that quiet guy. Watch the quiet guy. And that kind of resonated with me always, you know, throughout my life. And that's kind of how the approach I went. But, I mean, you know, hey, loud guys, you got to make money too, you know. Um, just got to be careful who you say shit to because sometimes you say shit to the wrong person, it's going to come back at you. And don't call the cops because that's the, the gayest shit ever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no names needed to be said right there. But we'll, <laughs> we'll let the MMA world figure that one out. Um, You were instrumental in – you know, being one of the faces and names for one of the biggest moments, I would assume in your career, I know in UFC history, and that was bringing the promotion to Madison Square Garden. And I know you fought there afterwards, but at UFC 205, being on that card, I'm not going to talk to you about that card because uh, I waited outside because I had an ex. You th- you, if you think Roger can beat this story, which I'm sure he can, I flew from Chicago to New York with an ex girlfriend of mine, had a four figure ticket through work that was waiting for me. And then in front of my entire family, the day of the fight, my girlfriend goes, so you're going to leave me here. And I was like, yeah, I, but that was the whole reason I, I came here. You weren't even, she wasn't even supposed to come on the flight. So we all went to wow. New York city and I had to give the ticket away. So I missed the oh, opportunity wow. to see you in person. But that's, what your ex, that's, that's an ex-girlfriend. Ex. Yeah, that's a that's yeah, a, that's a yeah. bummer, <laughs> That is the one where I'm like, every time I bring up UFC two or five, people are like, "Did you go?" I'm like, "I was in New York City." Like, <laughs> I was I was a couple blocks down the close. street. You're close. <laughs> that was close. But what was that moment like? Because obviously it was such a monumental night for the promotion, for the sport, for New York City, but obviously for yourself. What was that like? Yeah, that was awesome. You know, I was I was been like you said advocating for uh the, you know New York since I mean, geez, I think two thousand nine. You know, um, so the fight there, you know, seven years later, uh, I believe I I opened up the the pay per view portion of the card. Uh, it, it was awesome. Just the whole experience of it gave me a dope little silver ticket. You know, with the with the Madison Square Garden stuff on it, and um, I mean that was history right there. And to 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 be able to say. You know, I, I actually I went to the Congress. I went to this, you know, the New York Congress and this and that with with the UFC to kind of to help push this envelope and uh, and to be able to get it done and fight in that card was 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 uh, was special. I gotta ask you about a couple guys that, like I said earlier, you were intertwined with. Obviously, the biggest name in the sport, and he's going back and forth with Michael Chandler. First question on that is with Conor McGregor: Do you believe Chandler and McGregor will fight, and how do you see that fight playing out? Mm. Do I think it on? It's, it's so crazy. Who knows what? Yeah, I, I'll say yeah. I hope. I hope. I hope that fight happens. They had the show. They got the history. Chandler kind of deserves it. I think. Uh, you know. Um, I could see Connor being a problem early, super early, but as the fight goes on, especially if that one eighty five, as the fight goes on, I'm leaning Chandler heavy. heavy How nuts Chandler. is that for them to want to? For Connor to want to? It's fight. silly. It's silly, really. It's silly. Because they're both 55 pounders. 
Yeah, especially. And Connor still, even when he fought a 70 pounder, he fought a 55 pounder. You know, so he's really fought two weight class. He just hasn't cut weight for the other ones. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, going through different weight classes is something you know a lot about. And, uh, you know, another division you spent some time in was, uh, you know, featherweight and bantamweight. And we see Aljamain Sterling going from bantamweight saying he's never going back. Uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley kind of closed the show on that. He's the next one in that kind of McGregor effect where, you know, he's talking, but he is backing it up. But there's some speculation, like maybe that star power won't stick. Do you think Sean O'Malley will stick as a uh, superstar for the UFC? Uh, this next fight will definitely determine a lot. Um, you got to win. That's the thing. You got to win, especially at the right time. Like Connor won when he was, I mean, he was saying what he, what he said he was doing. That's, you know, pretty special. And that's why uh, he, he had the, he had the, the, the talk to talk, but he backed it up at the moment when he had to. Um, if O'Malley can keep doing that and ride that wave, yeah, I think he could be a, a pretty big star. Again, I don't know, though. All these guys say they're big stars, but I don't know if anybody sells like McGregor, you know, maybe Diaz. I know Habib like that. But no one's really selling, you know, and these guys are selling their soul to sell no, no numbers. It doesn't make sense to me. It's a big problem. And I'm almost just cr- trying to get some MMA headlines in with you. And I appreciate you being candid about it. Um, you, know, you know, as I just mentioned, Aljamain Sterling saying he's never going back. As someone who went through multiple weight classes, whether it's Sterling or a guy who may listen to this and it's his, he's getting ready for his first amateur fight ever. When fighters start to consider changing weight classes, what is the best piece of advice you have for them? Uh, you know, definitely approach the diet. You know, it, it's going to be different. You know, um, if you're going up or going, I, mean, I went down. So for me, I had to like, you know, zero in on that stuff. I didn't want that to be a, an issue and getting, getting away in my training. Um, but like, you know, for, for, for me, I just like, you know, everyone's like, oh, they're going to be faster down here or, or maybe not as strong th- there. I'm like, I don't know. I just approach every opponent as, as that opponent. You know, I didn't, I didn't even take into consideration what weight class we were in or anything. I kind of just approach each guy as a single event. There's a lot of talk right now in the highest of divisions uh, between John Jones, Steve Bay, and Tom Aspinall. You've got Dana White going, this is a, a legend versus legend fight. It, it's a legacy fight. We have to have it. And then Tom Aspinall was like, well, I, I want to fight both of them. Like, I want to fight John Jones. Mm-hmm. He's the greatest of all time. I'm the interim champ. What is the best case scenario of Frankie Edgar's mind to figure out this heavyweight fiasco yeah it's tough i feel for tom uh, i'm definitely a big fan of tom i hung out with him uh, uh last year back out in germany for for a gig um but yeah you know john jones is the man i think you gotta you gotta let him and and, and stipe hash this out uh you know i, I i'm the old head i'm, I'm kind of giving up to the old heads let them let them hash it out and <clears throat> take it from there um i think tom i get it he's worried maybe john fights steep a wins loses it and walks away forever i'm sure that's what he's worried about but again <clears throat> you got to give it up to the to the ghost of mma and uh and kind of let these old old guys hash that out and figure it out i although i do think tom aspinall is a special special guy man he might be the fastest guy i've ever seen a heavyweight like his hands might be the fastest hands i've seen a heavyweight by by far he's absolutely incredible and to do what he did in his last fight was just uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, one thing, especially some guys in a couple of the divisions you fought in, uh, most notably, I would probably say is Alexander Volkanovsky, another guy you know very well, Max Holloway. They've, they've opened up about what we don't see inside the cage, you know, the struggles of wanting to go to the gym and the struggles of what happens after a loss and uh, all those things that maybe certain fighters don't ever want to talk about without getting soft on you, Frankie. But could you uh, just kind of speak on, like, being vulnerable while also being at the top of the world or the top of the mountain in your division in, in anything you do, but especially a, a cage fighter. Yeah. You know, I, I just approached it you know, before as a cage fighter, I was a plumber, you know, uh, my, my, my stepfather was a plumber, worked for him. My, my real father worked a bunch of different jobs. He had to, he was a painter. He was a pizza man. He was, you know, worked as a maintenance man. And like they had to get up and work hard and pay bills and this and that. And, how can I complain as a fighter, dude? That's kind of how I approach it. Like, dude, I'm living, I'm living a dream. I'm living a movie. Um, even though if I'm on the, th- I'm on the top and I feel bad about myself, I'd be like, look in the mirror, be like, dude, what, 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 what are you feeling bad about? And I don't know if that comes from blue collar roots or whatever, but um, 
I know like the new thing nowadays is to talk and share. And I think if that's your route, by all means, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I was more of the guy to keep it to my chest and, uh, and get it done, you know? And, um, but like I said, I'm, I'm not one of those, you know, if, if you feel like you need to share or something, I think that's the best bet. But if you're a guy like myself where you can kind of handle it internally, then, Hey, did you look, look at, look at other people in different situations and draw, draw some motivation or for some perspective from them. That's kind of how I go about it. Absolutely. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful perspective. Um, to, and, I, and I mentioned this to Kevin. One thing I really loved about seeing you in, in a movie is that I don't have to tell you so many guys and girls walk away from the UFC or their MMA promotion. And then everyone's like, all right, let's start the timer now. When are they coming back? Is mm -hmm. it six months? Is it two years from now? And are they fighting at 45? But whether it's the podcast or, you know, everything else that you're doing, yeah, I just commend you on not being having to be the guy who's like, oh, man, I'm itching to come back. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be the guy going, so Frankie, is there a chance you're ever going to come back? But what led you to being like, all right, that that part of my life is over. Now it's time to move on to other things and and putting that at peace. Um, you know, I, I when I retired, I always knew I wanted to never to, to, to that be final, you know, and never come back. Um. And, you know, I, I got to gotta find other, other things to be passionate about. And, you know, I'm fine doing the movie. I'm actually opening my, my own my own school here uh, in my hometown, you know, real soon. Uh, you know, my kids and, and their sports kind of keep me busy. So uh, th that takes my focus away. Um, but never say never. You know what I'm saying? You still can never say never. <laughs> All right. Well, UFC 300 is coming up, Frankie. <laughs> Are we going to hear some news? <laughs> no, no, I, I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. <laughs> Listen, I would never say no to seeing you inside the octagon, especially now having an opportunity to speak to you. It's something I've wanted to do uh, for, for years, and I'm happy to finally have the opportunity to do so. Um, have you talked to Mark Henry about his love for Chicago deep dish pizza? Oh, yeah, dude. He's he's a maniac with that stuff. He, he'll eat a whole pie of that. A whole yeah, pie. I, that's, you know, they're huge, and they're huge. Yeah, he's a, he's a maniac. My uh, my uncle's a big fan of it, and we were just spending the holidays together, and it was like New Year's Day. He's like, let's get some, and I was like, great. As a Chicago person myself, I don't find that to be pizza. I, yeah, I don't, no, all right. Don't like, know what like, it is. You like East Coast style. I Okay, so I do, I do, but I like the tavern, square cut, like the pub style. That's okay. what I like the most. I like, all right. all I don't, right. but I do, I have, I've probably, I can say this, I've eaten way more East Coast New York slices than I've ever eaten deep dish. So that should give deep me Deep dish is like a meal. It's a meal. It's, it's, it's a, a meal. meal. That's all you yeah. need. That's yeah. all you need. You don't need anything oh, yeah. else. But uh, it, real quick before I let you go, can you talk a little bit about the Iron Army Academy? Yeah, yeah. I'm opening a school uh, right on Route 37 in Tom's River, New Jersey. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, always wanted to, to uh, uh, first was wrestling. When I was a wrestler, I always wanted to open up a wrestling club and then then I obviously got into MMA and, you know, I knew eventually I would open up a school, but never wanted to kind of get in the way of, uh, of myself competing. So now that I could share myself and pass on, you know, what I got to the next generation and, and these kids in my town, I'm, I'm excited to do so. Well, Frankie, this was an absolute honor and I'm super thankful you gave me the opportunity to talk to you. You, you killed it in the Bastard Sons. Everyone check it out on video on demand, uh, Apple TV, you can get on Amazon Prime. Uh, YouTube movies as well. There's so many places to get the Bastard Sons. Let's push for a sequel. Um, you, you did great work. And uh, thank you for all that you did in MMA. Thank you for the uh, TV fan of me of getting Roger out of that situation <laughs> and bringing him to the world. And uh, keep it going with the podcast, man. I, I'm a huge fan of not only you as a fighter, but you as a person and all that you do. So hopefully this won't be the first and last time we talk, but uh, it was definitely a, a blast. Mike, man, I had a great time talking to you, man. All the best to you, uh, you know, in 24, my man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Be good, brother.